1963 Ford Thunderbird two-door Tudor hardtop. It's the fancy Ford of the early 60s, the highest in the Ford fleet, the flagship model, a statement in personal luxury. To understand the Thunderbird's existence, you need to understand the Galaxy, Fairlane and the Falcon. Ford Falcon. This is your entry-level Ford, a cheap economy car to get you from A to B that's more basic than the personality of an Instagram influencer. This gets you on the Ford ladder. Ford Fairlane. This is needed because you've popped out two kids now and need the extra space to cart everybody around. It's one up from the Falcon and is essentially a stretched out and slightly widened with a few extra trim pieces thrown on for good measure. Galaxy. Dubbed as one of America's greatest cruisers of all time. The Galaxy presents a wide range of trim level, body styles and optional extras. This is Ford's full-size car. Available in two-door, four-door, convertible and the fastback model with its Ooh, sexy roofline. For most, the Galaxy is the top of the ladder. This is it. That's as far as you could climb. But wait, there's one more. For some, there is one more step to climb on Ford's ladder. Oh yes, the Thunderbird. The kids have moved out of home. There's no longer a need for the family wagon. You've been promoted at work, and you've worked the position long enough to enjoy its benefits. The stocks and shares have been successful this year. The mortgage on the house has been paid off. The kids have graduated from college with degrees and are leading successful lives. Your job is done. You've beaten life. It's time you were rewarded. So go ahead. Treat yourself. You've earned it. Buy yourself a Thunderbird. It's time for you to enjoy this personal luxury cruiser. But how did this personal luxury cruiser come about? History time! Welcome to 1955. The Second World War has passed and the American economy is looking bright and bold. Europe, meanwhile, is more broke than Katie Price as a result of the war, meaning spending money amongst European consumers is lacking more than the film Sharknado was lacking a plot. As a result, European car manufacturers started eyeing up American markets to provide some much-needed sales. European sports cars proved to be popular amongst American buyers and eventually established a sizeable market. American manufacturers wanted a piece of the new market too, and General Motors became the first to respond with the first-generation Corvette. With GM now having a piece of the pie, this would naturally force Ford to come up with a response. And they did. In 1955, the first generation of the Thunderbird went on sale, and basically took a giant shit on the Corvette. Ford outsold GM by miles with a car that was faster, handled better, was cheaper to buy, and had some touch of small luxury features such as power windows, heater, and a telescopic steering column, all of which the Corvette lacked. In 1958, the second generation Thunderbird arrives. Notice now that it has four seats and has become massively overweight and hardly resembles anything of the athletic body that it once had. It's like a PE teacher hitting retirement. Well, how'd that happen? The answer is simple. Robert McNamara. Robert McNamara is a dirty name amongst Thunderbird purists, and here's why. Frank Hershey, the chief stylish for the Ford division at the time, pushed his team to produce the design of the original 1955 two-seater sports car. And whilst it was a success, some Ford executives, in particular Mr McNamara, thought it could sell better. Robert at this point in time was the current general manager at Ford. He demonstrated a management attitude that focused on numbers and not much else. To him, cars were merely just a form of transport, or a way of getting from A to B, and didn't believe in fancy cars, sports cars, or adding luxury features unless it brought in additional sales revenue or higher numbers. An auto writer quoted in Robert Lacey's 1986 book titled Ford describes McNamara as he wore granny glasses and he put out a granny car. This referring to the basic and bare bones Ford Falcon mentioned earlier, which was heavily favoured by Robert and subsequently a sales direction he heavily pushed. So from this it's reasonable to assume our friend Bob the Bean Counter isn't a huge fan of the Thunderbird and didn't think it should remain as a two-seater. Although T-Bird sales were strong, Robert thought they could be stronger and insisted on adding rear seats which could widen the T-Bird's market. Frank Hershey opposed the idea but did have a four-door design at the ready. This model ran from 1958 to 1960 and sales shot through the roof. Robert was right. 
the additional rear seats boosted Thunderbird sales enormously. Thunderbird purists hated the fact that two seats became four, but at the end of the day Ford is a business, and it doesn't survive on making cool cars, it survives on making profitable ones. The second generation also gained a large amount of luxury add-ons, and was aimed at a more upscaled market. It was sold as a personal luxury vehicle. What's a personal luxury vehicle? Well, Ford couldn't classify their new creation. It wasn't a sports car anymore, and it wasn't a full-blown luxury car either. And it still only had two doors. So they just made up their own classification. Personal luxury vehicle. The early 1960s brought in change at Ford. Robert McNamara has now left the company to join President John Kennedy as Secretary of Defence. Talk about moving up in the world. Lee Iacocca now takes a seat as Ford's general manager. The Thunderbird now enters its third generation and has been restyled for 1961. The second generation has been criticised for its square shape and lack of sporty styling. So Ford responded. And they came up with this, one of the most iconic cars of the 1960s. Ford's automotive styling at its best. It's perfect. It's beautiful. The jet era and space race are elegantly encapsulated within this rolling piece of artwork. All the details are so perfectly placed. Details such as this chrome trim that creates an unbroken line that follows on from the curvature of the bumper, continues up along the length of the car before majestically fading into an understated tail fin, which moulds seamlessly into an afterburner tail light. There are no door handles. The trim fulfils this role. The front bumper and grille are one complete piece. The car is also a pillarless, rendering the roof a continuous flowing contour. The door is complemented with these fake vents that go nowhere and were just as comical back in 1963 as they are today. The hood scoop, however, is surprisingly functional. I was expecting that to be fake. The interior complements the exterior with a dash that effortlessly sweeps around the front into a centre console that dissects the inside space. The ergonomics and the placement of controls are perfect. The third generation lasted from 1961 to 1963, nicknamed the Bullet Bird due to, well, its bullet-shaped nose. The car you see here is the 63 model, so it's the last of this shape. For 1964, the car would be restyled to resemble a more luxury vehicle and would pretty much lose all of its sporty styling. Why? Because Iacocca has a little project he's been cooking up. The Mustang. An interesting observation here, there are no Ford badges on this car. Like absolutely none apart from this small badge located in the door shut. But why? Surely in creating a fine piece of work such as this, you'd want to inscribe your name all over it. Ford didn't because the Thunderbird was sold as an upscale and upmarket car. To consumers, Ford doesn't mean luxury or expensive. It's average, nothing special. But they wanted Thunderbird owners to feel special, as if they had a premium product. But Ford already has premium brands such as Lincoln and Mercury. So why not brand the car under these? I guess the Thunderbird could be viewed as too sporty for the Lincoln lineup. It could also present complications with the brand engineering with the Thunderbird name moving from Ford to Lincoln. It was a move Ford did consider, and after all, Thunderbirds and Lincoln models at the time were manufactured in the same factory. The cars even shared similar styling cues. Sales for the Bulletbird were strong, but not anywhere near as the previous generation, so Iacocca loaded up cars with novelty touches, such as power tops, in an effort to increase sales. Previously, the T-Bird never had any real competition, but similarly priced rivals started to appear, with GM presenting the Buick Riviera at a base price of $4,333 and Studebaker offering the Avanti for a base price that matches the Thunderbird at $4,445. So what does this personal luxury cruiser actually have to offer? This particular car has power steering, power assisted brakes, a three-speed automatic, power windows which were an optional extra, and an electrically adjusting seat. A feature I've never come across in any other car, and a feature I believe to be unique to Thunderbirds, is this swing away steering wheel, which was a standard feature. Other features available but not included on this particular car are air conditioning, power tops, continental kits, vinyl roof and wood trim which were available on the Landau model only, and finally seat belts. Oh yeah, you, you get these weird wind deflectors too. This is a factory thing, and they do 
sort of work to an extent. The motor. Under here is a 390FE V8. FE standing for Ford Edsall, and 390 being the engine displacement, 390 cubic inches, or 6.4 litres. This is a Ford big block, and is one of Ford's most widely used engines at the time after the Windsor V8. From factory, the power of this thing is said to be 300 brake horsepower. But horsepower back in the 60s was rated with the engine out of the vehicle, and all the ancillaries removed, including the water pump. So the figures are basically bullshit. Realistically, uh, I, I don't know. At best, this thing is churning out 260, maybe 265. But the torque is said to be around 427 foot-pounds, giving this lump of pig iron diesel-level torque. It's not revy. This thing's heavy and has a large displacement, so it takes a while for things to get up to speed. Probably red lines at 4,900 rpm, maybe 5,000. There's no ECU, there's no rev limiter, and it still has the original four-barrel carburettor. So if you just mash your foot to the floor, this engine would just become asthmatic and AFR choke before you could float the valves, if this engine was in a manual car. This car does, however, have an automatic choke, and it does work rather well. There's no choke cord. When it's cold, you just mash the pedal to the floor until it starts, and it will settle itself down. Cars here in the United Kingdom didn't have that until the late 70s, maybe even early 80s. This engine is pretty much standard. Only mod is electronic ignition timing for improved reliability. Everything else is stock. Even the gold paint on the air filter and the rocker cover is factory. Because, ooh, luxury. The transmission. In the early 60s, America's big three main car manufacturers had a small punch-up and were trying to show each other how big their balls were by trying to make the smoothest transmission possible. This went on for some time and eventually got so out of hand to the point where General Motors ended up making a transition so smooth it doesn't even change gear. But out of this, Ford produced a C3 Cruisomatic. It's a three-speed automatic and is the only transmission available for this car. Pretty much all other Ford models at the time had options for manual gearboxes, but not the Thunderbird. In 1960s America, automatic transmissions were seen as a modern thing. It was a fancy thing to have. A Thunderbird scene with a manual transmission would probably affect its upmarket reputation. So you couldn't have one of those. The gearbox is very smooth, it shifts effortlessly, and it has a kick down which feeds directly off the accelerator pedal. You just mash your foot to the floor, and the car makes a ton of noise and wastes astronomical amounts of fuel. Speaking of which, fuel economy. Take a guess what the economy of this thing is. Go on, have a guess. Bear in mind that this car also weighs just shy of two tonnes. Any ideas? 10 MPG. So what's it like to drive? Well, pretty much as you'd expect. The handling is boat-like, with the suspension being so soft the car leans over in every turn further than a Karen leaning over the counter asking to speak to your manager. A previous owner has added a second anti-roll bar and Monroe shocks in the rear in an attempt to stiffen things up, but even then it's still like driving a giant bobblehead. God knows what it was like before. The steering is super light because it's 1960s power steering and it's so heavily boosted to the point where there's no road feel at all. It's like one of those racing sims you find in an arcade. To have power steering in the 60s was showing off. It was considered a luxurious feature to have. In a similar way, the auto gearbox was mentioned earlier. Is it fast? No, not really. From a standstill, you can put your foot down, but there's a lot of car to get rolling. But it isn't painfully sluggish, nor does it feel underpowered. But once this rocket-shaped steel monolith does get rolling, the acceleration isn't that bad at all. Sure, it's no muscle car, but there's plenty of grunt to make an overtake. Braking. Well, this almost two-ton hunk of metal is situated on mechanical drums on all four wheels. Disc brakes weren't available until 1965, but the brakes do work, a bit spongy, and I wouldn't exactly say that they are that sharp, but they are servo-assisted, and they will stop the car if need be. The top speed of this thing is said to be around 120 miles an hour, but my balls aren't anywhere big enough to test that. Driving a 1960s American barge on British roads has its interesting quirks but generally it's not as difficult as a lot of people perceive it to be. There's no passenger mirror, as that wasn't mandatory at the time, 
this thing is fairly wide so you've got to keep as close as possible to the kerb if you want to avoid getting sideswiped. The dimensions are 5.2 meters in length and 1.9 meters in width with a wheelbase of 2.9 meters or 17 feet long by 6.2 feet wide and a wheelbase of 9.5 feet for those of you watching this in black and white. For such a large car, the reg room in the back is more disappointing than watching England play football. But that aside, the Thunderbird is one of the most comfortable cars to be seated in. The soft, wallowy suspension irons out all the bumps and imperfections. The seats are soft and you sink into them deeper than quicksand. Just like your grandma's sofa that hasn't been replaced since the 70s. This car is remarkably quiet in here. There's no creaking or rattling. There isn't even a great amount of road noise. And the engine is just a distant hum. It feels very refined, classic, but not old. We romanticise 1960s cars because of the way they take us back in time. The array of bright colours, free-flowing lines and curvy shapes remind us of a youthful, fun and carefree era. An era that was abruptly axed by the 70s, bringing in safety regulations, environmental regulations and the gas crisis. The energetic 60s styling would soon vanish and everything is going to become very square and very, very, very brown. It's because of this we idolise 60s cars and cast away their flaws and faults. Heck, we idolise the whole era, the lifestyle, the fashion. But to me, nothing really denotes an era quite like a car. A rolling assembly of parts that showcase the style, technology and attitudes of the time. This jet age design is the perfect time capsule of early 60s America. Feels like a stair lift. <laughs> <laughs>